in a redshift 8.31 Lyman break galaxy. Tom, would you like to share your screen? Yes, let's start. Okay, um, yeah, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today I'd like to talk about how we characterize dust and uh, carbon in the epoch of reionization. And um, I've really enjoyed the, the question sessions inside the Slack previous couple of days. So I would like to suggest everybody who has questions to please uh, just throw them onto the throw them onto the Slack. And if I go too fast in this uh, in this presentation, please find these slides on my website. Uh, the link is given there. So I, I'd like to talk about the dust budget crisis that um, that we're experiencing, where high redshift Lyman Bray galaxies appear to have more dust than is able to be produced by supernovae and other phenomena. So um, this is actually quite surprising because initially we weren't quite so convinced, as for example, Jorge Zavalas showed yesterday, that uh, there, that dust played a major contribution in the high redshift universe. So, um, however, here I would like to use a single galaxy, a high redshift Lyman break galaxy, and show how we used ALMA to characterize both its spectral lines and its spectrum to look at um, to look at both this dust production and to hopefully provide a solution to this problem. So um, first, I will talk about the source. I will talk about how the spectral lines are able to characterize the uh, the metallicity and different properties of the source, and how the dust continuum is a very important probe for future follow up. So, um, Max 416Y1 is a Y band dropout behind the Hubble Frontier Field Max Y1. So, this uh, Lyman Bray galaxy is a is detected, and we can see the spectrum on the left-hand side, where we see the redshift at redshift 8. It looks at around, or it is about 2 kiloparsec in size by 1 kiloparsec, and it looks like it's composed of multiple components. And provided by Tamu of 2019, they executed an oxygen redshift search, and they find the redshift just, uh, at 8.3. They also detect the dust continuum at 850 micron, and the oxygen is well detected. Using UV to far infrared modeling, we can find a stellar mass and star formation rate that agrees with models of galaxy formation of a young stellar population. However, this young stellar population cannot account for the high metallicity we find of these sources. Neither can it account for the dust mass we find, further uh, suggesting a dust budget crisis, but this suggests that there exists an older stellar component at redshift 15. So yesterday's talk by Robert Sporsani uh, further exemplified this and the power of ALMA in, in these situations to probe older stellar components and uh, older production mechanisms. So together with the oxygen, it drove us to look for a C2 emission of this galaxy, another very bright spectral line. And unlike previous sources, we find that the spatial positioning of these sources is similar in both spatial positions and in velocity space. The oxygen and the carbon are coming from seemingly similar positions. This is strange because C2 is more uh, associated with atomic or with neutral gas, while oxygen-3 is mostly only found close to very strong uh, UV radiation sources. So when we compare the luminosity, as I'm sure uh, the talk later by Harikane, but also a poster by Hagimoto, which should be on the Slack soon, um, we find that the ratio between the oxygen and the carbon emission of this galaxy is significantly higher than uh, is seen in local galaxies. Only in dwarf galaxies do we see ratios this high. And we find this ratio to be common among high redshift galaxies. Part of the explanation was maybe offered by Carniani 2020, who showed that the C2 emission is more extended and therefore more often missed. So we correct for this in the leftmost source. Our source is the orange bright spot in the, in the center. And we see that it has a very high oxygen over carbon ratio. This suggests very strong radiation fields or many other 
uh, properties to do with the, the galaxy evolution. Now, if we continue to look at the C2 luminosity versus star formation rate, we find that it falls below the typical Deloza relationship. So not the source does not fall on, uh, on the Deloza relationship. And it actually falls among a bunch of Lyman alpha emitters and not among Lyman break galaxies between redshift five and seven. Instead, our source at redshift eight falls uh, among Lyman alpha emitters. And this could be because the uh, differentiation between these two sources fades as soon as the me medium in which it resides is mostly neutral. Indeed, it agrees with the Lagash model, which takes into account uh, PDR development at, at very high redshift. Our spectral line was bright enough that we were able to differentiate a velocity gradient across this source between uh, uh, across this source, which is suggestive of rotation. This was previously also seen by Smith 2018 into high redshift Lyman Bray galaxies. And I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, results from the Alpine survey tomorrow. Um, the velocity of the line width compared to the velocity gradient is suggestive of rotation, but it could also be suggestive of an outflow. And this was uh, demonstrated nicely in Fujimoto 2019, who showed that uh, there exists a wide distribution of, of C2 emissions. And similarly, in the Alpine, the most star-forming Alpine sources, we see that there exists C2 emission at very large uh, velocities. However, um, yeah, uh, this is also suggested by galaxy models, such as Arata 2019, which suggests a sort of pulsating galaxy evolution at high redshift. So here we see that it's very important to have both uh, the kinematics that Alma is able to give and directly compare it to models. Now, if we just take a back of the envelope calculation, and we put a little postage stamp onto this source, we can calculate that the mass loading factor, so the amount of outflow versus star formation rate, is on the order of 0 0.1 to 100, meaning that if, in this if indeed this is uh, an outflow, then outflows are significant in the early evolution of, of galaxies. I'm looking both to the talk later today, and I'm looking forward to the talk of uh, Fujimoto tomorrow. Now, we failed to detect continuum emission around the C2 spectral line, while we did detect 88 micron continuum emission. And this puts a very strong upper bound on the spectrum of this source. As such, we expect this, uh, this source to be significantly high in temperature. And part of the reason that this is important is because such high dust temperatures mean that the dust mass on average is lower. This has also been suggested by galaxy evolution models such as Palatini 2019, where they show that a lot of the dust exists uh, at relatively cold temperatures, but the predominant dust that is seen exists at high temperatures. So the dust, uh, the luminosity weighted dust mass is indeed uh, very high. Part of the reason this is a problem is because we look at these galaxies, not just at continuum, but we're looking at spectral lines. So we're looking at oxygen three lines or we're looking at C2 lines. And typically in the local universe, these fall around the positions you're able to characterize the SCD. However, at the high redshift universe, this could be that uh, we're missing out this information because it's both very difficult to probe short rest frame wavelengths and at the same time, not looking at a spectral line is more hard or is harder to justify. Just because the amount of dust mass is lower does not mean that the dust is less luminous. It could in fact be that dust plays a more important role than we previously assumed. But it would solve the problem of uh, the dust budget crisis. So maybe I went a bit quickly here, but I hope I've shown that uh, Lyman-Bray galaxies are very important probes of 
early galaxy evolution. And uh, with these sources, and especially using ALMA on these sources, we're able to target spectral lines that are able to characterize the ISM of these sources and look at the morphology or the kinematics of them. Personally, what I find very interesting is the spectrum and the dust emission of these sources. And I'm looking very much forward to using uh, galaxy evolution models on uh, dust production and thus trying to constrain uh, stellar populations. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, Seiji Fujimoto asks, do you find any difference in the kinematic structures between the C2 and the O3 lines? Unfortunately, the O3 line was not uh, observed significantly enough to, to see velocity structure. But when we looked at the moment, uh, the first moment map, we did not see any uh, velocity gradient. How much deeper do you think that data would need to be to extract any O3 kinematics? Yeah, so um, we uh, our ox oxygen line detection was around the sigma of eight, mm -hmm. while C two was at eleven or twelve. So it wouldn't have to be that much further. It could be an interesting uh, pursuit. I agree. Thanks. Um, we also have a question on um, what's the stellar mass of the Redshift fifteen stellar population. Ah, this would be, I think, a factor of 10 higher. So allow me to switch through my slides real quick. If I can pop up. Okay, so um, I think we find a young stellar population of 10 to the power eight around that. I think the older stellar population would be 10 to the power nine. However, uh, it wouldn't interfere with uh, the Hubble emission very much. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, can you place lower limits on the dust temperature? Ah, I should have said this, of course, but um, indeed, we've, uh, we've placed lower limits on the dust temperature uh, of around 80 Kelvin. Okay. Um, I think we can squeeze in one more. Um, Jorge Zavala asks, was the 850 micron dust continuum measurement corrected by the line contamination? Sorry, can you repeat that question once more? Oh, sorry. Was the 850 micron dust continuum measurement corrected for line contamination? Yeah, exactly. This is a uh, line subtracted uh, dust continuum. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, there are a few other questions that are in the chat, if you could uh, answer those offline. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them. Um, and we'll now move on to Yorit Matthew. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Yorit, are you ready to share your screen? All right, is it fine like this? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank the organizers for organizing this meeting. And it's very nice to see all these results and to actually catch up with many of you on the chat. Um, yeah, so my name is Jorot Matei. I'm a Zwicky Fellow at ETH in Zurich in Switzerland. And today I'll actually present some results uh, looking at luminous line and altimeters in the epoch of reionization, uh, mostly with the MUSE GTO team, uh, partly at ETH. So these objects that I'm studying are um, selected to be they are selected to be strong line and altimeters with narrow band surveys based on uh, ground-based telescopes that observe very wide areas on the sky, uh, a few times the, the full moon. And these objects, of course, are a biased sample of the high redshift galaxy population, but they are a sample that you can observe easily um, with spectra, because you know that there is an emission line by selection, and you also know where the emission line is. And particularly if you do this for a wide field area, you, you select bright objects. So these are some, some of the objects that we found and, and confirmed the redshift for over the years. Um, you can all see very high signal to noise Lyman and alpha spectra. Um, and just some general overview on these properties. So by selection, I think these galaxies reside in highly ionized regions, perhaps bubbles at the end stages of the epoch of reionization, because otherwise we would not see their Lyman alpha line with such high luminosity. The intergalactic medium would have uh, uh, rescattered the line out of the line of, line of sight. Um, and the most extreme example of this object, of this kind of scenario, is 
this object Cola One, discovered by Hu et al., uh, the team in, in Hawaii uh, in 2016. And we observed this galaxy um, later with higher resolution and better signal to noise to actually confirm that this is a double peaked Lyman altimeter at redshift 6.59. It's very high, it's one of the few uh, double peaked Lyman alpha meters known. It was the first one to be confirmed to be that at such high redshift. And the fact that you can see the blue peak of the Lyman alpha line really indicates that, that this galaxy is in a highly ionized region that's very large, uh, large enough to redshift to allow the blue, even the blue Lyman alpha photos to redshift out of the resonant frequency of the intergalactic medium. Um, so that means that this galaxy actually already traces how, how what, what the kind of bubble sizes are. Of course, those sizes are a bit uncertain, but this is really tracing uh, reionization. Um, in addition to that, the peak separation of the Lyman alpha line um, is a very good indicator of Lyman continuum leakage. And as seen in low redshift analogs of high redshift galaxies, this uh, Lyman continuum leakers are all double peaked. And the peak separation, the velocity separation of these lines uh, correlates with the escape fraction of ionizing photons. Uh, for this galaxy, which is actually a very bright galaxy um, and it's compact, the escape fraction is actually, inferred escape fraction is very high. So this means that we are directly witnessing a galaxy contributing to reionization. That's nice. Um, looking a bit more into what are these kind of galaxies, um, I think many studies are now finding that luminous Lyman break galaxies and, and Lyman alpha emitters, with the samples overlap, um, consist of clumps in the UV continuum and as seen by Hubble and in the carbon-2 emission as seen uh, by ALMA and I think some objects actually show dust continuum at different locations of the UV continuum as well. And these are clumps on two kiloparsec resolutions. And that resolution is not very high, I would say. Um, so these galaxies are really um, complex structures uh, that are assembling together. And it makes the spectroscopic follow-up a bit more challenging because you actually really need IFUs to, to be sure that you're observing uh, the actual clump that you, you want to look at. Um, and in this talk, I want to present some results on MUSE observations of this galaxy CR7 that we discovered in 2015. Um, there's a nice artist impression. The galaxy consists of three components in the UV continuum, basically three complexes of star formation. Um, already from the ground-based Subaru narrowband imaging, we saw extended Lyman alpha emission in green on this uh, image. Um, this galaxy is particularly interesting because it's one of the brightest Lyman alpha emitters at this high redshift. When we initially found it, it was a good candidate for hosting stars with properties that were predicted to be um, for a population three stars. In particular, the absence of metal lines uh, and this tentative helium two line. Now, of course, signal to noise is not great. You would like to reobserve this, uh, but it's still um, this is a bit interesting because immediately when we found this. It's also a bit of a mystery why you can get such a, high, uh, a massive and bright galaxy to um, host these uh, first generation or very uh, low metallicity stars. Because the universe is 600 million years old, but there's still, there's still quite a lot of time that you need to um, make sure that the gas is not polluted by metals from earlier star formation. Uh, so it's kind of a, a problem, perhaps. Um, and the other more empirical issue with this object is that all the similar objects in terms of luminosity that you observe at later points in cosmic time uh, are AGN and they're not powered by star formation. Um, I think the, the, the hypothesis that this galaxy is dominated by population three stars was ruled out most convincingly by these re resolved carbon two line emission observations um, that we presented in 2017. And this image shows the UV continuum again, but in the contours, you can see carbon-2 emission from the interstellar medium. It overlaps with various UV components, and it's actually seen at multiple velocities, but that, that's shown by the, uh, by the different uh, colors. Um, on the scales of the, simul of, these, uh, of the resolution of these observations, which is really about two kiloparsec, the interstellar medium seems to be relatively normal in terms of the metallicity of 0.1 solar, of course, this is not super accurate metallicity from this, this line. Um, but it, in general, I think it really shows that these galaxies are complex assembling uh, structures. Um, 
And with Muse, so with the Muse DTO, we actually wondered what can we learn from the Lyman alpha emission from this galaxy? So we knew that Lyman alpha emission was extended from the narrow band imaging, and we knew it was bright and narrow. Uh, but with the Muse IFU, what, what that instrument allows you is to basically get a spectrum for each pixel. I'll show that later. Um, and we observed this with, uh, with the ground layer AO, which means that we actually got a very good resolution and definitely, definitely resolving these different components that you see in the UV continuum. Um, so yeah, this is basically the grid. You can imagine that basically for each point, each cell in this grid, we actually get an independent Lyman alpha um, spectrum. And the questions that we are asking um, are, where does the Lyman alpha really originate? Which of these components is, is causing it? And how extended is the Lyman alpha emission? And in particular, how does this low surface brightness Lyman alpha emission compare to other galaxies? Um, just to show this very quickly, this is basically an optimal Lyman alpha image that's constructed with the IFU. Um, you can see here in black contours the UV continuum with the same convolved to the same resolution. And in the colors, you see the Lyman alpha emission. You can see in red, it peaks at the, at the center where, where basically most of the star formation is happening. Um, but it's really extended up to 15 kiloparsec scales. Um, and each of these apertures, you can actually get spectra. Um, in these spectra, I don't want to discuss them in detail, um, but you can see carbon two in green and then Lyman alpha in the, uh, the black uh, uh, without any color. And you can see velocity offsets between Lyman alpha and the systemic are changing throughout the system. So it's really quite uh, complex. Um, we tried to do resolved Lyman alpha modeling to really see where Lyman alpha is produced. And we actually found that throughout this entire extended system of Lyman alpha emission, the line profile is quite constant. It's uh, this very clear uh, asymmetric red peak that's seen in the, in the left. The equivalent width of that line is about 100 angstrom, which is very high, but it's not impossible to explain that with uh, star formation, with a, a metal pore burst of star formation. Um, around this component B, which is actually quite a faint galaxy, we see good evidence for a second Lyman alpha emitting component um, on top of this extended Lyman alpha line from the from A. Um, it's a bit detailed, and I, I'm happy to answer questions on Slack on how we did this. But we did uh, resolve Lyman alpha fitting, and we managed to fit the Lyman alpha profile with a two component model. Um, with one component that's really the dominant component that you can see on the left. This is just uh, the flux of that component. It's really, it's this elongated Lyman alpha halo that peaks at the UV, at the peak of star formation. And then there's a second thing on at component B. But even though you can see it quite clearly, note that I actually multiplied component two by, by 10. So even at that position, the extended emission from A uh, dominates. Um, and the extended emission is the last part that I want to discuss uh, for one minute. Um, similar to other studies that have been done with MUSE, um, you can try to model the extended Lyman alpha emission with a combination of UV continuum-like and, and an exponential halo. Um, that's what we did, and we modeled that, and we found that actually the majority of the Lyman alpha photons are seen in this extended halo component, 70%. And you also see that the extended halo component is elongated in the, the direction of these other UV clumps. So this means that we see, we're seeing in this galaxy this complex structure where there are three uh, clumps of star formation uh, with, uh, with the ISM as well. But here we actually are seeing the gas in the circ circumgalactic medium that is nurturing these bursts of star formation. Uh, finally, regarding the profile of this extended emission, um, shown in the data points here, um, this profile is actually extremely similar to normal Lyman alpha, Lyman alpha emitters after the epoch of reionization observed with MUSE. Um, those are shown in red, and the red dashed line is just an example of a single object at redshift 4 that's rescaled to have the same luminosity, and you can see this, the profile of the halo is very similar and within the uncertainties. So this is, seems to be consistent with this picture that the CGM of, of the, this galaxy so this very luminous Lyman alpha emitted redshift 6.6 is similar to galaxies in the post reionization epoch. And it's actually a bit different from a stack of fainter Lyman alpha emitters at the same time by Mamose et al. We, we measure a much shallower uh, halo scale length. So that could indicate that these the fainter Lyman alpha emitters, their Lyman alpha lines actually scatter more because um, their environment is more neutral compared to this bright uh, galaxy. 
Um, I'm just going to leave you here with my summary, but I want to end with a short outlook. Um, the image here, this, this is an IFU image of the Lyman alpha light. And of course, the outlook that we're all waiting for is, is, the, is how this, this galaxy and others are looking uh, when we observe them with the near spec IFU. And basically, the IFU has a field of view of three by three arc seconds. And um, if the Lyman alpha emission um, is actually produced in this halo uh, instead of scattering, we would see extended H alpha emission in the entire IFU of, of James Webb. So that's something uh, to think about, uh, to look forward to. And um, I'm really happy to answer any questions now or on the Slack uh, later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yorit. Uh, we do have a few questions. So Sultan Hassan asks, to do the fitting with the shell model, what parameters did you vary and what are their best values? So we, when we do the line fitting, we do not use a shell model. Um, we use a, a, an asymmetric Gaussian, um, the skewed Gaussian. Um, but I, I can show those, those values on, on Slack. I think that's better. OK. Uh, Maxime asks, do you have the kinematics of clumps B and C with respect to clump A? And if so, are these infalling like an emerger or outflowing? Um, we have, so clumps A and B are from carbon two, I think that's the, you know, what he's referring to. Um, these are at the same redshift. So, so sorry, clump B is at the same redshift as clump A. Uh, C is uh, redshifted with respect to it. Um, I actually have to check to, to be to be fully sure, um, but um, I'll answer that on the Slack to be to, make, to be sure I don't say anything that's wrong. Okay, um, and then a couple more. Do you? This is from John Chisholm. Do you see spatial Lyman alpha peak velocity shifts attributed to the major component? Uh, yeah, tentatively we do see that the there's there's a asymmetric. Uh, line, alpha line that's shown in the top left here becomes slightly the peak of that line becomes slightly redder towards the outskirts uh, of the of the halo, which um, is uh, similar to seen in some redshift three line and alpha emitters, and could be due to resonance scattering. But um, the other thing is that at this component B, we see this faint line and alpha emitting component, and that actually has a much larger uh, redshift with respect to the systemic than the main peak. The main peak is redshifted by two hundred kilometers per second this fainter component by about 400. Um, it's a bit challenging for that because there are actually two systemic redshifts at that position. So <laughs> you're not sure. OK, uh, there are a couple of questions, but I think we've basically run out of time. Uh, yeah, if you could please jump yeah. onto the Slack and answer those when you have time. Uh, thanks yeah. very much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Yuma Sugahara. Um, would you like to share your screen, Yuma? So Yuma is going to tell us about fast outflows identified in early star forming galaxies at redshifts five to six. Thank you. Oh, sorry. And thank you for the introduction. I am Yuma Sugihara, a postdoc at the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan and the Waseda University. I'd like to present uh, our results in the last year, our last year paper uh, for the fast measurements of the galactic Galactic outflows in star forming galaxies at range 5 to 6. Uh, this is a collaboration work with these researchers. So, the galaxies are thought to be evolving in a baryon cycling. And this picture is supported by many numerical simulations, but uh, it's difficult to observe this uh, baryon cycle directly, uh, especially for at high red shift. So we are focusing on the outflows in star forming, high redshift star forming galaxies. So in our previous work, we, uh, we showed that the outflow velocity increases from redshift zero to two. So then what, how about the higher redshift? So John Edwards suggests that degrees and do Edwards shows a flat evolution. So which is correct? And there is a no data point at high redshift higher than four. So if we brought a data point at this redshift range, we can see, uh, we can know the average evolutionary trend of the outflow velocity. But there are some challenges for the outflow study at high redshift. First, uh, usually, uh, to measure outflow velocity, usually we use the out 
a blue shift of the absorption lines. So we need a deep rest UV spectra of the high redshift shift galaxies. It's expensive observation. And moreover, to measure out blue shift of our absorption lines, we have to know the precise systemic redshift. But unfortunately, there are, there are no strong nebular emission lines in the rest UV spectral range. Uh, there is a strong lime alpha emission, but uh, uh, this, the velocity or redshift uh, is uncertain for lime alpha emission. The solution we'd like to present here is the uh, combination of the deep UV spectrum and the recent atom observation of the carbon to 158 micrometer. And the galaxy sample with these two key observations are already open. So we use the uh, uh, archival seven lima break galaxy spectra taken by Peter K. Bucket old. So these galaxies from HZ1 to HZ10 are observed by the Keck of Deimos, and we can use the deep rest UV spectrum as well as uh, absorption lines. And these galaxies also are also observed by Alumer and detected in carbon-2 emission lines. So we use these carbon-2 emission lines for systemic redshift and to measure out blue shift absorption lines. But unfortunately, uh, the individual rest UV spectra have low signal to noise ratio even in this sample. So we stack these deep U less, uh, sorry, rest UV spectra and obtain the composite UV rest UV spectra. The so top panel shows the rest uh, UV composite spectrum. We can see the clear lime alpha emission, and the Korea metal absorption lines. And the bottom panel is zooming up through these metal absorption lines. We can see the absorption lines are blue shifted with respect to the particle lash line, which is a systemic redshift. And to measure the outflow velocity, we first, we fit the Gaussian-like profile to the absorption lines. Then we, uh, we define the outflow velocity as a 90% flux of the bottom from bottom of the absorption line, and uh, this velocity from the systemic redshift is defined as a, a true maximum velocity. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the results. Okay, this figure shows the ultra maximum velocity as a function of the star formation rate. These blue, cyan, green data points are taken from our previous study, and this study at the ratio five to six it comes here. The orange data points are show the measurements for silicon two, carbon two, and silicon four, and these three measurements are consistent with each other. And please look at the red square. Uh, this is a measurement for simultaneous fitting for the silicon two to silicon two and uh, carbon two. And uh, this measurement, so the ultra velocity at ratio five to six, is seven hundred kilometer per second. So this value is much higher than redshift zero, but are comparable to redshift two. And this is my first, our first result. The so next, I plot it out for velocity as a function of the halo circular velocity. We calculate halo circular velocity from the stellar mass with, uh, with using uh, these relations. Our observational data points are like on a line in a sing on a single relation. And interestingly, our observations are in good agreement with the prediction by numerical simulations. So this black solid line is a fire simulations, and a dashed line is illustrious TNG-50 simulations results. So supported by these numerical simulations, our observation suggests that the halo circular velocity strongly correlates with the ultra maximum velocity. Then this is a, a little shift evolution of our maximum velocity. Uh, our data show our data is consistent with the uh, uh, numerical simulation lines, and the previous observational results Jones et al. Uh, except for these data points. So this figure shows the ultra maximum velocity monotonically increases with increasing redshift, and this evolutionary trend is naturally interpreted as uh, interpreted if ultra maximum velocity linearly correlates with halo circular velocity. Because halo circular velocity is proportional to redshift to the 0.5 at fixed halo mass. 
So if outflow maximum velocity linearly correlates with halo circular velocity, uh, outflow maximum velocity should follow the same follow the same uh, equation relation. That is, the ultra maximum velocity rapidly increased at lower redshift and uh, relatively flat evolution at higher redshift. Okay. I, okay, I show the ultra maximum velocity is uh, co tightly correlated with halo cycle velocity. Uh, but at the same time, the halo cycle, uh, sorry, ultra maximum velocity also correlate with the star formation rate. Then, the what galaxy parameter determines uh, ultra maximum velocity, especially throughout all lead shifts? To know that, I plotted ultra maximum velocity as a function of the galaxy properties. These figures show the, as a function of the halo circular velocity and star formation rate. And this blue solid line is the best fit relation at redshift zero. And this black dashed line is the best fit relation at red through, throughout redshift zero to six. And in these figures, these two relations have similar slopes. This means that the ultra maximum, uh, ultra maximum velocity uh, Sorry, uh, predicted by the uh, relation, best with relation at redshift zero, can predict the measurements at other redshifts. On the other hand, as a, uh, this is a plot as a function of the specific star formation rate surface density and a specific star formation rate. In these figures, these two relations have totally different slopes. This means that star formation rate surface density and the specific star formation rate can, exp uh, can explain the ultra velocity at a fixed redshift, but it's difficult to explain with uh, this relation, sorry, this relation at redshift zero cannot explain the measurement at other redshifts. Okay, in summary, if, uh, if there is a fundamental galaxy property to determine ultra velocities throughout all redshifts, it would be the halo cycle velocity or star formation rate. Okay, finally, I'd like to compare our results to the recent uh, observations. For example, Alpine survey, uh, uh, in Alpine survey, the Northfield world shows that the uh, Taiwan 2 emission line have a broad component in highly star forming galaxies. This broad component would be created by the galactic outflows and its FWHM is very consistent with our results, our outflow maximum, velocity, eh? maximum outflow velocity. And Fujimoto et al, uh, who will give the talks tomorrow, uh, finds that the spatially extended carbon-2 emissions uh, comparing to the UV stellar, stellar, uh, UV stellar luminosity, UV stellar light. So this spatially Broad, uh, spatially extended carbon-2 emission might be explained by the past outflow activity. Like these observations, I think the uh, outflow study at outflow study at high redshift will get much progress with upcoming of new observations. Okay, this is a summary, mm -hmm. and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Yuma. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, Matt Hayes asks, um, I, think I, I think I saw various different absorption lines mentioned, uh, C2 and silicon-4. Are the Vmax constant with the ionization potential of the species, or is there some variation? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a bit difficult question, because uh, our first, our, oh, sorry, OK. Our results show the, it's constant. So the silicon, carbon-2, silicon-2, and silicon-4 show the uh, velocity, comparable, velocity and uh, comparable velocity with each other. But uh, they have a large, relatively large air levels. So, so yes, in our, in our analysis with a stacking uh, UV spectrum, uh, these different absorption lines show the similar ultra maximum velocities. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Uh, another question from Roderick Covertier. Uh, Vmax probably correlates strongly with star formation rate surface density. Could you comment on that? Uh, yes, thank you. So the, yes, as the previous papers, 
out from maximum velocity will correlate with a halo cycle, uh, sorry, star formation with soft density. Mm -hmm. But in my, in my talk, in, my, in our paper, I'd like to say the out from maximum velocity is um, correlate with star, star formation with soft density at a fixed star formation, uh, sorry, at a fixed redshift. But uh, if in, with increasing redshift, uh, star formation rate and uh, galaxy size will increase, uh, sorry, will, will evolve. So the, at higher redshift, star formation rate will be, get higher and size will get smaller. So we'd like to uh, check uh, our, our results show the ultra specific star formation rate surface density can explain the ultra maximum velocity at a fixed redshift, but this relation cannot explain throughout all redshifts. But this will be uh, this should be checked. So the, this relation will uh, hold at a fixed redshift or throughout all redshifts. Okay, uh, thank you. There's another question from Daryl Santos. Based on your results, can we consider the possibility that outflows promote star formation activity at higher redshift? Sorry, uh, outflow should. Uh, so can you consider the possibility that the outflows are promoting star formation activity at higher redshift? Promoting? Or enhancing? Yes, I, it's difficult to show. I, I think it's difficult to show from my, our results uh, because we only see the outflow velocity uh, to, to see the effect of the outflows to the feedback to stop formation rate is we have to measure the outflow velocity and uh, pr probably outflow mass or energy or something. So to see the effect feed, like a positive feedback, we should see some more, for example, the local galaxies uh, to get more much high SN observations, I think. Okay, um, I'll try and squeeze in one more question. So a couple of, this is from Gareth Jones, a couple of the CAPAC sources show evidence for ongoing merging. Have you seen a difference in the stack when using a subsample? Uh, thank you. Imagine, so I tried to uh, stack the subsamples with, uh, for example, the only HZ1 and HZ10. And uh, we didn't see the, any difference for the ultra velocities for with dividing subsamples. Okay, I will squeeze in one more. Um, are, from Ken Ozato, are the outflows isotropic? And is there any evidence for collimated features like jet? Oh, oh, thank you. It, it, it's important feature. So the, mm -hmm, okay, it's important, uh, but it's difficult to, to determine the, so the inclination or the shapes of the galaxies at a high redshift. So at the lower redshift, like the redshift zero to 0 0.5, we can see the inclination effect, but this redshift, uh, it's difficult. So now I'm assuming the isotropic outflows, but uh, it might be effect, effects at this redshift, even at the redshift six. But in this, time, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, if inclination affects uh, at high redshift, at redshift five to six, uh, at raw maximum velocity will get increase. Okay, thank you very much, Yuma. There's a couple more questions on Slack, if you could uh, have a look at those, and we'll move to Yoshido uh, Fudemo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yoshinobu, can you share your screen? Sure, yeah. Right. So uh, yeah, we're going to hear now about dust attenuation properties and obscured star formation at the edge of the reionization. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So my name is Yoshinobu Fudamoto from University of Geneva. I'm working with Pascal Ish. Um, today I'm going to talk about dust attenuation properties and obscured star formation at of star forming galaxy that reached between four to six right after the reionization epoch. So as we all of us know that there's many two wavelengths range where we can observe that the star formation activity of galaxies, one is the rest frame UV wavelengths and another is the far infrared wavelengths where we can observe uh, dust, um, dust unobscured activity and, all, and dust obscured activity of galaxies. So these two wavelengths uh, 
wavelength emission from these two wavelengths is tightly connected from dust attenuation, as you know. And if there's more and more attenuation exists in these galaxies, this UV spectrum becomes redder and redder, and this the attenuated energy is transformed into the to the to the fine infrared emissions. So these uh, correlation between this dust attenuation and re re emission can be um, translated into the one of the relations, so-called IRX beta relationship. So this is the relation between the UV spectrum color and those and the y-axis is the emission in the fine infrared. So this relation is um, very useful in particular for estimating the dust attenuation correction in the very high rest universe. For instance, if we observe the galaxy at rest greater than seven, in the typical case is that we only have the rest frame UV photometry. And even in this case, using this IRX beta relationship and the, the UV spectral slope measurement, we can estimate the attenuation correction and also can estimate even the infrared luminosity of these galaxies. So however, the one, one potential problem is that this dust, uh, dust attenuation is highly empirical relation. For instance, this dust, dust attenuation is dependent on dust, in, dust extinction line of sight effect of dust and the stellar to dust geometry and also the intrinsic UV slope from which we observe the reasoning of the UV spectral slope. So because of these dependencies, these IRX beta relationship or dust attenuation relation is should be examined and confirmed by observation directory. At risk around two, for instance, spitzer observation are deep enough to detect infrared emission of these galaxies and Reddy et al. Find, found that this main sequence galaxy is still consistent with the local uh, relation found by Myron 1999. However, at the more high risk universe, the situation becomes a bit different because we, we need ALMA to observe fine infrared emission individually. And in the first, first ALMA surveys has revealed that the, this galaxy could be um, very faint in far infrared, suggesting some evolution of dust attenuation properties. And for instance, a couple of years ago, uh, Peter K. Pak 2015 has shown that this act, indeed, this IRX beta relationship could be different in a very high rest universe. And compared to the lower rest galaxies, this infrared emission is is much, much fainter than expected from the UV colors. However, these observations are uh, based on a relatively small number of observations. So we need to increase sample size to, to confirm and expand these studies. So uh, we studied the collaboration in the Alpine survey. So just quickly, introduction about Alpine survey is that this is the ALMA large program to observe large sample of main sequence galaxies at rest 4.5 to 6. Um, our main sequence galaxy is wide, wide parameter space, uh, almost two decks, both in stellar mass and star, form, star formation rate. And using 70 hour of ALMA time, we, we targeted C plus emission line and thus continue and got a large fraction of C plus emission line detection and also measured a large amount of flux measurement of these galaxies. As you may know that, that the, the result of, from our Alpine survey has already been published and several projects is still ongoing. And if you are interested in, please look at this individual paper. But, but for the tomorrow session, we will, the Seiji Fujimoto will talk about C plus halo uh, studies and Yana Kusanova will talk about obscure star formation rate density and Gareth Jones will talk about C plus kinematics. So um, as you know, the Alpine survey is led by Olivier Refebvre, who has um, sadly passed recently. Uh, he was, yeah, during this co collaboration, he was a very energetic leader of this collaboration. And I, it was great honor for me to, to work with him. And I uh, terribly feel, feel terribly sorry for his passing. Yeah, so let's go back into the uh, dust attenuation of high-risk galaxies. So, to study these uh, dust attenuation properties, we first need to estimate infrared luminosity of these galaxies. To do that, we first created the, the average infrared SED of these galaxies using alpine analogs in Cosmos in terms of stellar mass and star formation rates similar to the alpine selections. Using st stack analysis of Herschel and Scuba 2 and all images, we created this um, average SED of applicable to these alpine samples to estimate infrared luminosity of these galaxies. 
And then because these galaxy have a large amount of ancillary data set using these ancillary data, we performed a CD fitting to estimate UV luminosity and UV spectral slope. So using these informations, we uh, created IRX beta diagram for, it, for these high resolution galaxies. These field points are individual detections and this uh, downward triangle is the straight sigma upper limits and squares are the stacking analysis for which I used uh, both detection plus non-detections. Blue is rest around 4.5 galaxy and red is for red, red, red greater than five galaxies. So first thing is that these individual detection and stacking analysis show that these galaxies have, have relatively lower IRA, IRX value than compared to the, to the lower ratio local, local IRX beta relationship. And another thing is that this galaxy, the distribution of beta apparently exceed much bluer than the in intrinsic UV spectral slope measured or expected from the lower local universe. So our conclusion here is that this galaxy can be characterized by bluer intrinsic beta characterized by minus 2.63. And then the, these, these galaxies are consistent with very steep dust attenuation curve, similar to SMC like, like dust extinction. And compared to the lower redshift galaxies, these galaxies show that very deficit of IX values. And these are consistent with the, with the previously found evolution of dust attenuation properties. Another interesting point of looking at this Rx value is that because Rx infrared excess is defined by the ratio between star formation rate from infrared and ultraviolet, we can uh, study the obscured fraction of star formation rates. For instance, Whitaker et al. 2017 has found that the obscured fraction of this galaxy defined by infrared star formation rate divided by total star formation rate is pretty much constant at between relative 0 to 2.5 and both of uh, all of the obscured fraction and versus stellar mass relationship follow the uh, same relation between these redshift range. If we plot our galaxy to this diagram shows that our galaxy at, in particular for the redshift 5.5 galaxy shows very low obscured fractions, suggesting very rapid evolution of dust obscuration between these redshift. But nevertheless, this galaxy, at, in particular for the massive galaxy, already shows that the, about 50% of obscure fraction of star formation activity, suggesting that this uh, dust obscure, obscuration is very important even in a very high risk universe or potentially in an in a epoch of reorganization. So just a summary. So we have found that the evolution of dust attenuation property and dust obscuration. And another important point is to go to the even higher risk shift, so we are now working in with the another Alma Large program with Rebels. The Rebel is, Rebel is the PI of Richard Bowens and which will observe 40 UV bright main sequence galaxies with photometric redshift of 6.5 to 9. We will scan the C plus and O3 or O3 uh, emission line of these galaxies. So in the cycle seven, we already got 85% of data and then we are getting very, this very exciting uh, result, and hopefully in the near future we will can we can have pub we can publish uh, these exciting results quite soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, the first is from Denny Bogarella. Using a sample of redshift five LBGs, we found that a dust temperature of about fifty six Kelvin. I think alpine galaxies are also UV selected. Did you estimate the dust temperature for alpine and how does it compare to other work? Yes. So in, yeah, for example, in, in this SED model, we measured about 40 Kelvin of peak dust temperature, which seems to be a slightly different from, uh, yeah, slightly a bit lower than the, the other result. Yeah. And also we measured like four galaxies for, with multiple multiband observation with ALMA and which, which are very consistent with our uh, results. So this galaxy have, seems to have about 40K in our sample. Um, and do you think there's any difference in the selection that's causing that difference compared to other samples? 
Yeah, very good question. Don't worry if you haven't thought about it. <laughs> that's right in this. Yeah, that's a very difficult question, and I don't, I sorry, I don't have uh, an no. answer at this point. Um, we have another question from Laura. Uh, how do you compute this uh, infrared star formation rate for single sources having only one continuum observation? Yeah, that's a very tricky, tricky point. And um, yeah, we yeah, in principle we don't know the 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 individual shape of fine infrared SD. So we are standing on the we are we are uh, pretty much relying on this average infrared or uh, average infrared SD. So yeah, on the on the uh, yeah, so individual sample could be the scattered because of these difference of high infrared SED, but on the on the ensemble average, we should be the safe sort of these stacks should be um, yeah con should be consistent with this average SED. So we are our yeah we are pretty much relying on this average data point. Um. There's a question from uh, Rebecca Bowler. Uh, in making your IRX beta relation, did you stack in bins of beta? Of beta? Um, McClure 18 showed that the stacking this way can cause a bias in the derived relation. Yeah, we, we tried both stacking based on the stellar mass and, and uh, beta. But yeah, in principle, we, yeah, so this is the like stack of, of the stack in bins of stellar mass. And we also have, have found a very low amount of infrared luminosity of these galaxies. So we, this low uh, IRX is, is pretty much consistent both from the bin, in bins of stellar mass and beta. Okay, um, another question from Tom Tones. Do I understand correctly that dust obscuration really gets going at the same characteristic stellar mass where AGN seem to set in? If so, do you have some intuition why this would be? Uh, sorry, so do you, is this a question about AGN contaminations? Or, um, uh... I think it's that the dust obscuration gets going at a similar stellar mass to where AGN will have an impact. So do you have some intuition why this might be? Mm, yeah, it's a bit difficult. Difficult question because the identifying AGN is already extremely challenging and very interesting, interesting indeed interesting question how much of the AGN exists in these high redshift massive galaxies. But at, at this point, we check the stacking of Chandra images and and then other um, stacking of the UV spectrum. But at this point, I we didn't find any um, yeah good crew of how many how much of these galaxies have AGN or these uh, potential AGN contaminations. Okay, thank you very much, uh -huh. Yoshino, uh, Yoshi, no, sorry. Uh, we're going to move on to the next talk. Uh, Guo Chao, are you yeah. ready? To thank stay? you. Thank you. And yes, if you could check the Slack channel again for the questions we didn't get to. Our next talk is by Guo Chao Sun. Uh, probing cosmic reionization with the tomographic ionized carbon mapping experiment time. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So, um, sorry, give me a second. Um, okay. All right, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm a rising fifth year graduate student at Caltech. And uh, I'd like to first thank the organizers of uh, CESREC for organizing the meeting and allowing me to give a live talk today. So uh, today on behalf of the time collaboration, I will talk about probing cosmic ionization with the tomographic ionized carbon, uh, ionized carbon mapping experiment or time. So uh, just to get started, uh, Kiri Kukare uh, has introduced yesterday the idea of line intensity mapping from the perspective of uh, millimeter wave instrumentation. But just in case some of you are still unfamiliar with this um, relatively new idea, I'd like to first quickly review the basic concept. So conceptually, intensity mapping uh, refers to the statistical measurement of spatial fluctuations in the intensity of a certain emission without resolving individual emitters. So here is an illustration of uh, what, basically what intensity mapping measures. So the two panels here um, contrast, or I mean, compare 
the halo density field against the line intensity field tracing the dark matter distribution in a like sort of smeared manner. And because individual emitters are not resolved, intensity mapping provides an economical way to survey the large scale structures in our universe with uh, relatively coarse beams. And more importantly, um, intensity mapping is complementary to galaxy detection in the sense that instead of probing just the bright emitters, uh, photons from even the faintest galaxies or diffuse emission can be captured in this case. And you are welcome to check out this uh, review article by Eli Kovacs et al for further details about the intensity mapping technique. Okay, so as we know that um, there are still a lot of open questions about the EOR and the cosmic dawn. And this is basically uh, why we gather here today. And the answers to these questions can be actually studied by um, either resolving the sources, namely trying to detect individual galaxies and quasars, or by mapping the collective emission, uh, the collective uh, line emission as what people do with uh, line intensity mapping technique. So as shown in this plot, uh, the ionizing sources driving ionization can be studied by mapping tracers of star formation activity, such as uh, H-alpha, Lyman alpha, and C2, whereas the island of neutral IgM can be mapped by the 21 centimeter line of atomic hydrogen. And the complementarity between these tracers of ionized or, um, and uh, neutral gas means that their cross-correlation can actually be used to confront foreground contamination and more importantly, to constrain the reionization topology by tracing the size evolution of, of ionized bubbles. Okay, so there are a few reasons for uh, C2 to become the target signal of our experiment time to study reionization. So first of all, the 158 micron C2 line is the major coolant of the neutral ISM, which makes it uh, actually the brightest far infrared line that comprises up to 1% of the total far infrared luminosity of typical galaxies. Next, uh, it has been, the C2 line has been identified as a reliable tracer of star formation with almost the same line luminosity uh, versus SFR relation holding from local universe to redshift as high as five or six. And also, uh, as I've mentioned, that the cross correlation of 21 centimeter signal um, be between the 21 centimeter signal and C2 line um, in, in the near future, we'll be able to measure the size evolution of ionized bubbles. And finally, the EOR C2 signal uh, redshift into a relatively transparent atmos atmospheric window, which is important for uh, ground-based observation like time. Okay, so just to give you some quick overview of the instrument and the kind of survey that we'll uh, uh, conduct. So, the instrument of time is simply speaking a high throughput imaging spectrometer array consisting of two major components. So one is a total of 32 grading spectrometers that are divided into two banks and one of which as shown here. And the other is the superconducting TES bolometers, uh, which is why we need this multi-layer uh, or multi-stage cryogenic system to cool the detectors all the way down to about 250 millikelvin uh, for the detectors to, to work. And the instrument will be installed on a 12 meter ALMA prototype antenna at Kid Peak. And here uh, the photo shows the moment when our cryostat was uh, moved into the cabin of the 12 meter telescope during our first engineering run in the winter of 2019. And in terms of the survey strategy, uh, as illustrated here, uh, time is designed to conduct a 2D line scan to optimize the sensitivity and case based coverage. And along the spatial direction, we, have, uh, we will survey a total area covered by 180 by one beams. And along the spectral direction, we have 
44 scientific channels covering a total bandwidth from 200 to 300 gigahertz. And each of those channels has a resolving power of about 100. All right, so in order to quantify how well time can inform us about realization by mapping C2 emission, we need a valid model that links uh, high redshift C2 emissivity to the realization history. And specifically, our model is based on a simple linear relation between the C2 luminosity and UV luminosity of galaxies on log scale, which is calibrated against available observational constraints on the C2 luminosity function. And the, C, uh, the UV luminosity, uh, or effectively the star formation rate of galaxies as a function of halo mass and redshift is then derived from the halo abundance matching technique. And the resulting star formation rate is used to calculate the global realization history. So using our FID issue C2 model, we expect time to measure the C2 power spectrum at a total SNR of uh, greater than five in, uh, in the two set bands of time. And it is important to point out that because of the nature of a line scan, uh, C2 power spectrum that are originally measured by time will be in two dimension, as shown by the black shaded regions, which are basically projections of the true 3D power spectrum um, showing red into the two, two dimensional space by the survey window function. Okay. So from the power spectrum measurement, uh, we expect time to first of all, place some robust constraint on the C2 luminosity density between redshift uh, from uh, about five to nine as shown here. And the cosmic star formation rate density can then be constrained to about 30% uh, by marginalizing over uh, the C2 parameters involved. And such a constraint from it, it is important to know that uh, such a constraint from intensity mapping like time um, will not be dependent on assumptions of the, um, about the faint end extrapolation. And then the most interesting application of time result to the EOR science is probably in terms of breaking the degeneracy between the average escape fraction of ionizing photons and the faint end slope of uh, galaxy luminosity function. As you can see in this corner plot, the blue, red, and green contours represent the constraining power from just the CMB opt uh, optical depth plus quasar absor absorption spectrum. And, uh, CM and in the red case is uh, the CMB plus quasar plus time. And finally, the green case is um, if we assume two times better time sensitivity. So the strong degeneracy between the F, between F escape and the fin and slope uh, characterized by the parameter C uh, may be lifted, especially after a factor of two increase of sensitivity is enabled uh, by conducting a time-like survey from Chile. But of course, there is an important caveat here, which is um, that the C2 SFR relation must be known to uh, very, uh, very good accuracy to have such level of constraining power, which is in fact sort of uh, difficult given the complexity of uh, C2 production in the interstellar medium. All right, so just uh, before finishing, uh, I would like to spend um, a few more words on, about the issue of contamination due to foreground emission lines, as well as the opportunities they bring. So in practice, uh, time will only see the, uh, time will not only see the EOR C2 signal, but also pick up a series of CO rotational lines from lower redshift, as you can see in this plot. So uh, these so-called line interlopers are mixed together with our target EOR signal and cause a serious problem of foreground contamination. And for example, in this plot, if you compare the C2 power spectrum models showing blue and yellow to um, all the other lines representing the power uh, due to like a CO foreground. But fortunately, uh, to deal with these kind of like foreground emission lines, 
people have come up with uh, a number of different techniques like I listed here, uh, such as cross correlation, masking, and the usage of K-space and isotropy. So uh, that being said, uh, these foreground lines are not just um, troublemakers. They actually provide useful probes of uh, how the star formation is supplied by molecular gas near the so-called cosmic moon. Specifically, we are able to extract the strength of these CO lines by cross-correlating spectral channels of time corresponding to a, an adjacent pairs of CO transitions emitted from the same redshift. And then as shown in this plot, if we assume some prior knowledge about uh, the COJ letter, we'll be able to translate our cross power measurement into competitive constraint on the cosmic uh, molecular gas density. Okay, I guess um, just uh, thanks everyone for listening. I'll just end up here with my summary slide and take your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, just a quick question as those as the questions are coming in. Um, you mentioned that your model was very dependent on knowing the C2 to SFR relation well. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you thought about different far infrared star formation traces? to help you calibrate that relation or, or looking to some of the other lines that you're open to detecting? Yes, uh, definitely. So I think um, uh, since that uh, in order to say anything about the EOR science uh, would require uh, very good knowledge of, uh, about like how we can convert uh, like a C2 measurement into an SFR. We definitely want to consider uh, in a like a multi-tracer context um, by including some other lines, if if they're available, they they, they won't be prop, they won't be available directly from our like time data set, but by combining with some ancillary data like um, say the observation of O3 or some even some nitrogen lines, we're hoping to um, like use this like multi tracer technique to be, to help us better understand how we we should con convert our like C2 intensity into uh, star formation rate estimation. Um, I think Renska Smith had a related point in that the O388 line is brighter than C2 for many of the Redshift 8 uh, EOR galaxies. Exactly. And yeah. easily detectable. Um, and does that also help you to get rid of the interlopers and would it be a better tracer than C2 to target? Right. In in some sense, yes. Um, like uh, I think, uh, especially in the past few years, I think there are a lot of research about like um, like O3 being a, like a brighter and even like more promising tracer of star formation rate uh, in a very high redshift universe compared with C2. So I think uh, definitely uh, the and that, but like unfortunately time will not see it first of all. But uh, I think a joint analysis or like um, Will will benefit a lot a lot from the like recent studies of O3 like when we are um, investigating our like C2 observations. Okay, uh, I'll squeeze in one more question. Uh, how would your results change if the C2 SFR relation would break, i.e., change towards a steeper slope at low SFRs? That's a question from Yorick. Right. So um, the the C2 SFR relation, um, sorry, um, will mostly affect the shape of the power spectrum. So the exact slope and um, the intercept of this relation will have a strong effect on the sh exact shape of the C2 power spectrum that we see. So uh, depending on the direction of changes, um, we'll probably have a lower or higher signal. Um, from our observation. So, so, but that also means that our power spectrum measurement will be a, like a sensitive tool to like help constrain the C2 SFR relation. Okay, thanks very much, Jason. Uh, we'll move on to the final talk now, um, which is Yuichi Harikane. Uh, would you be able to share your screen? Yes. Um, so Yuichi is going to tell us about a large population of ALMA galaxies at redshifts greater than six with high O388 to C2 uh, flux ratios. 
Okay, so can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. So, hello everyone. I am Yuichi Harikane. Uh, today, uh, so first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to give a talk. So today I will talk about our recent ALMA observations of high red shift galaxies and ISM properties of high red shift galaxies. Okay, so ISM properties, interstellar medium properties of high red shift galaxy is important to understand cosmic ionization. For example, the ionization parameter U ion is uh, maybe related to the escape fraction of the ionizing photon. And these ISM properties are usually investigated with rest frame optical emission lines, such as O3 and H alpha. However, these rest frame optical emission lines are red shifted to the mid infrared wavelengths, uh, where the uh, ground based telescope cannot access at red shift beyond five. On the other hand, as a fine infrared emission lines, uh, such as O3 88 micron and carbon 2 158 micron, can be observed at redshift beyond five uh, with ALMA. And indeed, ALMA detects uh, O3 and carbon-2 emission lines from several high redshift galaxies, uh, including the most distant emission line galaxy reported at redshift 9.11, and also the redshift 8.3 Lyman break galaxies uh, Tom, reported, uh, Tom showed in a previous talk. However, there are only six galaxies uh, with both O3 and carbon-2 observations. So in this study, uh, we show more examples with, uh, uh, with uh, O3 and carbon-2 observations and study the ISM properties of such high redshift galaxies using uh, O3 and carbon-2 observations. Okay. Yes, so our targets are three Lyman black galaxies at redshift six uh, identified from our Subaru Hyper Spinkham survey. As the Lyman alpha emissions are clear, uh, spectroscopically confirmed, uh, these three Lyman black galaxies are spectroscopically confirmed with Lyman alpha emissions uh, shown in this uh, bottom uh, spectrum. Okay. And we conducted ALMA observations uh, for these three target, targeting O3, carbon 2, and nitrogen 2 emissions. And here I show the result. So these panels show the emission line map of the O3, carbon-2, and nitrogen-2 of our three targets. Uh, we clearly detect O3 and carbon-2 emission lines uh, more than whole sigma significance levels uh, whose positions are consistent with the UV counterpart. Nitrogen-2 emission lines are not detected. And these panels show the spectrum around the emission lines. Uh, we can clearly identify these uh, emission lines of O3 and carbon-2 and the red shifts are consistent with each other. Then we calculate the O3 and carbon-2 luminosities and compare with previous result. So both panels show the, uh, these two panels show the O3 luminosity and the carbon-2 luminosities as a function of the star formation rate. And our red shift, uh, and our red shift six galaxies are indicated with these uh, red diamonds here. And other high red shift galaxies are indicated with these uh, red circles. And blue and green lines show the lo uh, lo local galaxy relations. So blue line shows the local galaxy, uh, local dwarf galaxy relation. And green line shows the local starburst galaxy relation. So as you can see, O3, uh, regarding the O3 luminosity, uh, high red shift galaxies uh, show the comparable O3 luminosity to the low metallicity dwarf, uh, local dwarf galaxy relation with uh, this blue line. On the other hand, uh, regarding the carbon-2, uh, most of the high red shift galaxies shows uh, carbon-2 luminosities lower than low metallicity dwarf galaxy relation. And the uh, carbon-2 luminosity is uh, more comparable to the low uh, local starburst galaxy relation. Okay, so as a result, if we calculate the O3 to carbon-2 luminosity ratio, the O3 to carbon-2 luminosity ratio of the high red shift galaxies uh, more than uh, three to 10 times higher than redshift zero galaxies given star formation rate. So in this figure, x-axis is a star formation rate and y-axis is the ratio of the O3 luminosity to carbon to luminosity. So our uh, high redshift galaxies, including our three redshift six Lyman break galaxies uh, shows uh, indicated with these gray, uh, red points and gray, uh, gray circles show the uh, redshift zero galaxies. So high-red shift galaxy so shows uh, three to 10 times higher 
O3 to carbon to luminosity ratio than uh, local galaxies. Actually, this trend is uh, reported in previous work by Nicolas Laporte, 2019, but this time we confirm this trend uh, with larger, so, uh, larger sample. Also, very recently, uh, Stefano Cardiani et al. 2020 uh, report a possible carbon to detections in some of high redshift galaxies uh, that were previously reported as upper limits. But if we use uh, the carbon to luminosities reported in Stefano Cardiani's paper, then still it shows as a, as a higher O3 to carbon to luminosity ratio uh, than the local galaxies. So anyway, uh, it looks like the O3 to carbon to luminosity ratio of the high redshift galaxies may be higher than local galaxies. So this uh, high O3 to carbon to luminosity ratio may indicate some uh, evolution, redshift evolution of the ISM properties. So it's important to understand the physical origin of this high O3 to C2 ratio. So in order to uh, investigate the physical origin of O3 to high O3 to C2 ratio, uh, we, we conducted cloudy calculations. In order to make the discussion easier, I convert this uh, plot to this plot. So in this plot, uh, the x-axis is a star formation rate, a carbon to luminosity to the star formation rate, and the y-axis is a O3 luminosity to the star formation rate. And the red points show the uh, high redshift galaxies, and the gray points show the redshift zero galaxies. And the right panel shows the cloud results of the cloudy cal calculations. It's a little bit complicated, but these lines uh, show the ratio at fixed metallicity and density with changing ionization parameters. So color shows the fixed metallicity, and the dotted, dashed, and solid line shows the different density. And if, for, for example, if we increase the ionization parameters, then O3 uh, luminosity increases while carbon to luminosity decreases. So if we increase the ionization parameter, it moves to this uh, direction, indicated with this red, di uh, red arrow. Also, if we in uh, increase the density, then both O3 and carbon to luminosity decreases. So it moves to this direction, indicated by this uh, red diamond here. Also, if we decrease the de uh, metallicity, then O3 uh, luminosity changes uh, to uh, decreases, while uh, carbon to luminosity does not significantly change. So among these three parameters, we found that a higher ionization parameter can explain the high O3 to C2 ratio. So compared to the local galaxies, 10 times or 100 times higher ionization parameter can explain the high O3 to C2 ratio. On the other hand, uh, the carbon to emission mainly come from photodissociation regions, PDR. So PDR covering fraction, CPDR, is also an important parameter. So if the PDR covering fraction is zero, then it indicates that, it indicates that, that galaxy has no PDR. So we found that a very low PDR covering fraction can also uh, explain the high O3 to C2 ratio observed. So this is a schematic figure of the high redshift galaxies. So compared to the local, galaxy, uh, low metal, uh, local galaxies, high redshift galaxies may have uh, 10 or 100 times higher ionization parameter, making a larger ionized bubble, uh, making the larger H2 regions was a very low PDR covering fraction. Of course, the combination of these two scenario is also possible. 10 times higher ionization parameter and 10% PDR covering fraction can explain the observed high O3 to C2 ratio. Okay, so if the, this scenario is true, then lime alpha photons escape uh, from these galaxies. So in order to check this, this uh, scenario, we check the correlation between the O3 to C2 ratio and lime alpha equivalent width. And we found a possible correlation between these two quantities. So it indicates that higher ionization parameters or a lower PDR covering fraction can enhance the Lyman alpha escape and, and eventually Lyman continuum escape from galaxies. So it indicates that all high O3 to C2 uh, ratio galaxies may uh, significantly contributing uh, to the cosmic reionization. Okay, so I will summarize my talk. So we confirm high O3 to C2 ratio of the high redshift galaxies uh, with larger samples. And the physical origin may be high ionization parameter or low PDR covering fraction, uh, both of which are consistent with the possible correlation between uh, with Lyman alpha equivalent with. Okay, so that's it, and I'm happy to have questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a quick question. Um, so how likely is it that 
um, part of this enhancement is due to a very extended diffuse component of C2 that isn't being detected on the ALMA data. Yes, yeah, it's a very good point. Uh, regarding our sample, our high, uh, Redshift 6 sample, uh, we use a very large apertures uh, to cover the extended component of the carbon too. And regarding uh, uh, other uh, high redshift galaxies, uh, carbon two emission uh, luminosity are mainly uh, estimated with the CASA, uh, CASA fitting. However, if we have say, consider that extended emission, then still it shows, uh, yes, it still shows, yeah. So, so it still shows uh, some evolution indicated with uh, Stefano Cardinali's paper. So I think Stefano's uh, consider the extended emission, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we have a question from Hayato Shimakuro. In the case mm -hmm. of uh, redshift six to nine, O3 to C2 is higher than redshift zero. How about at intermediate redshifts? Mm, it's uh, an yeah, interesting point, question. So if it's just a monotemic evolution, then uh, intermediate redshift galaxies would be located here. But the difficult point is that it's very difficult to how say, uh, investigate the O3 and carbon to emissions of uh, these uh, intermediate redshift galaxies. Um, I'll just add, there are some measurements from uh, the PAX spectrometer redshifts one to two that I'll uh -huh. in the chat. Um, okay. Another question from Yorit, uh, interesting multi-line analysis and comparison to photoionization models. In your plots, you show equivalent width um, integrated Lyman alpha. Could you clarify how you measured the intrinsic Lyman alpha equivalent width for the object? Yes, yeah, it's interesting, uh, good point. Yeah, we uh, convert the uh, observed Lyman alpha equivalent width uh, to the in intrinsic uh, Lyman alpha equivalent width using the redshift defendant relations calibrated with the Lyman alpha luminosity uh, function and the UV luminosity function. A question from Christian Finlater. Is it possible that when explaining high O3 to C2, an ionization parameter is actually degenerate with an alpha enhanced ISM? Uh -huh. Yes. So I think it's related to, yeah, yeah the, how say, the carbon, carbon oxygen abundance ratio, right? So, yes, yeah. Carbon, uh, the low carbon oxygen abundance ratio can have say partly explains high O3 to C2 ratio, but if we have say take the very extreme case of the lowest carbon to oxygen abundance ratio, uh, still uh, some of the high redshift galaxies uh, like these galaxies cannot uh, explain. So we need combination with other effects, I think. Okay, one last quick question from Dan Ko. Will NERSPEC definitively distinguish between high ionization and lower PDR covering factors? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, NERSPEC can how say, measure the ionization parameters using O3 to uh, O3 to O2 ratio. So we can de uh, degenerate uh, these two scenarios with JWST NERSPEC. It's very exciting, I think. Well, thank you very much, Uchi, and for all the talks we had in this session. They were really fantastic talks. Um, there's still a lot of questions that we didn't get to, and apologies that we didn't get to your question, but please do carry on the chat in Slack. There is now a break discussion uh, with the topic of surviving the quarantine, uh, sharing your stories of how you relieve stress during the quarantine. Um, the link for accessing that is in the general Slack chat, Slack channel. Um, so please do go and join in there. And otherwise we will see you back here uh, in half an hour. Thanks everyone.